three seventy is beard. Three hundred and seventy million. Three hundred and seventy million. Back to Francois's client at three hundred and seventy million dollars, ladies and gentlemen. Four hundred million. The audience is gasping because that's a lot of money for a painting. That's maybe a Da Vinci? And we don't even know where it is now. So it's not the biggest scam in the world because Bernie Madoff takes the cake for that and will probably for some time. But this might be the biggest art scam in history, allegedly. Well, yeah, I'm not saying it is a scam for sure, but I'm just going to give you some facts and you can make up your own mind. Anything made by Da Vinci is a very big deal. He dabbed into many fields, not just painting. Astronomy, anatomy, botany. He was like the Joe Rogan of his time. Bill Gates has some of his notebooks that he bought for millions of dollars. So the Salvatore Mundi has many versions, but we're going to focus on the original one, the one that we think was painted by Da Vinci, of course, which had been lost for centuries. So it's kind of like an NFT. There are others out there, but only one was painted by Da Vinci, maybe. It first appeared at an auction in 2005 in New Orleans. Yes, New Orleans, the classic place to find newly unearthed Da Vinci masterpieces. It's kind of like the Mormon books, they keep finding new stuff, you know, like, wait, there's one more. The description read after Leonardo Da Vinci, suggesting it's in his style. Here's a colored version of what it looked like. I mean, the eyes are completely f***ed and the globe kind of blends in. More on the globe later. So it didn't look great, and this art picker named Alexander Parrish and his colleague Robert Simon bought it for just $10,000. An art picker is someone who buys art at small auctions and then sells it to wealthy clients at a profit. So already, it was entirely in this guy's interest that this painting would be more than what it seemed. But how did it end up in New Orleans? I'll do a quick recap because it's not very interesting, but it's important to take into consideration. The painting was likely commissioned around 1500 for Louis XII of France. Then it was acquired through marriage by Charles I of England, and then because he was broke when he died, they sold it to a mason named John Stone. Then it was returned to the crown of the Charles II. Then there's nearly 250 years of... Uh, and in 1900, Sir Francis Cook buys it. Then in 1958, an American on a trip to England buys it for 45 pounds and gives it to his nephew, whose estate then sells it in 2005 in New Orleans. So there are a few clues as to why this would be Da Vinci. It's painted on walnut, which is what he preferred, and it was unusual for the time period. Other Italian artists uh, preferred poplar. The way the hair is painted is classic Da Vinci, and it's something really hard to replicate. But the biggest clue was discovered in 2006 when the beat-up painting was given to Diane Modestini for restoration. She basically used chemicals and scraped the layers that were painted over. <laughs> This is what I mean here. First, various people painted over it over centuries, then she scraped that off. I mean, it's not ideal, is it? So anyway, she found out that there were two thumbs, meaning that the artist had changed its mind on how the thumb should be positioned. And so it had to be the original because you wouldn't change your mind if you were just making a copy. And so then she basically filled in the blanks herself. My husband, um, Mario Modestini, was a very great restorer. He's really considered, you know, the most important restorer of Italian paintings of the 20th century. The painting became a way for me to kind of um, keep him alive in my mind because I would talk to him as I was working on it. I, you know, conjured him as I was working on it because we'd had, you know, so many conversations that I could actually know what he was going to say and what he would think. So is this a crazy lady painting? Once she was done restoring it, it became a quest for Parrish and Simon, the owners of the painting, to show or persuade colleagues in the industry that this was a Da Vinci. And then Sir Nicholas Penny, the director of the National Gallery in London, saw it and thought it would be a great coup to show it in a new Da Vinci exhibition. At this point, the owners are saying it's a part Da Vinci, part Da Vinci students, part restoration expert. But then in 2010, the National Gallery was like, nah, let's show it as a Da Vinci, period. Here's a quote. In an email, Sison, the exhibition's curator, told me the authentication was the result of slow, painstaking, independent assessment. You need to study the scientific evidence incredibly carefully. Does what can be seen in X-ray or infrared or in paint cross sections agree with what we know of the artists of the period? But ultimately, the conclusion has to be based on connoisseurship and what we, as trained and experienced experts, can see with our own eyes. He likened an artist's technique to handwriting, a unique signature that can be recognized, but he also suggested the judgment 
judgment came from the power, the energy of the picture when you're standing in front of it. Yeah, so let's throw science out the window and go with gut feeling. So the National Gallery authenticated it as a Da Vinci in 2011, and in 2012 so did the Dallas Museum of Art for some reason. And after that, that's when it started to get juicy. In 2013, a Swiss dealer named Yves Bouvier bought it at a private Sotheby's auction in New York for around 80 million dollars. Think about those two owners who bought it for just 10 grand less than 10 years before that. <laughs> The Swiss guy then immediately sold it to a Russian billionaire, Dmitry Rybolovlev, for $127 million. This would be a flip worthy of HDTV, except Rybolovlev had hired Bouvier to buy the painting for him, and he was only supposed to get a 2% commission. <laughs> Lawsuits ensued, of course, and Sotheby said that they had no idea that Ribble of Lev was the intended buyer. I don't know what the f that was. As it turns out, that guy Bouvier is a real piece of shit. He's involved in many other lawsuits, he hid his gains on offshore accounts, and also laundered money. I mean, there's a down brown book somewhere in this whole story. Let's not feel too bad for the Russian billionaire though, because although the painting had been on a tear recently and had been shown at the National Gallery and then sold for more than $100 million, there was still room for it to be sold for even more money. As it turns out, before the National Gallery exhibition, a few museums had seen it and weren't interested, considering the $100 million price tag and how much restoration had gone into it. So a private sale was the only option, and Rybolovlev uh, chose Christie's to auction it, and they were brilliant with the marketing. They were very vague on the restoration in the description, they just showed a small, blurry, pre-restoration photo of it, and then this happened. At 280 million dollars, are we all done? Maybe not. Don't take the photograph quite yet. <laughs> You could be 290, Alex. 300. I thought so. 300 million. 328 million. Here at Christie's at 350 million and looking for another bid, please, Francois, at 350. 400 million. Sabaton Mundi selling here at Christie's. $400 million is the bid, and the piece is sold. This guy is doing the performance of his lifetime. He's loving every second of it. Also, because although the winning bid was $400 million, there was an additional $50 million in fees going to Christie's. Not bad for our buddy Rebel of Lev. And okay, so who bought it? I'm gonna try to say his name. Ready? Bader bin Abdullah bin Mohammed bin Farhan al Saud, a little known Saudi prince who actually bought it on behalf of the main dude, Mohammed bin Salman, or MBS, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, who bought the painting as a gift for the newly opened Louvre Museum in Abu Dhabi, like a gesture from Saudi Arabia to the UAE, and then the painting disappeared. But it was supposed to be displayed in Abu Dhabi in the Louvre when it opens. Yeah, no. Cancelled. As it turns out, the painting became a source of tension between France and Saudi Arabia when the Louvre in Paris refused to show it next to the Mona Lisa. MBS wanted the museum to display it as a Da Vinci period, and by showing it next to the Mona Lisa, they would seem equal. This even had France's presidents involved because of various projects in the works between France and Saudi Arabia. But because the Louvre used their world-leading technology to examine the painting and find out exactly to what extent the painting was a Da Vinci, they thought it would tarnish their credibility, the credibility of France and the Louvre. And at that point, the reputation of the painting was... was f So the painting is now allegedly on MBS's super yacht. Because, yes, what better place to store it than a floating building exposed to salt and weather? This is a trend, apparently. A lot of billionaires have museum-grade art on their super yachts. So what do you make of it? Is it a real Da Vinci? Not at all? Maybe a little? It's the only one where the subject is facing straight, dead on. In the end, there was a transfer of $400 million from Saudi Arabia to Russia, so the CIA might want to look into that. Oh, and the globe, I almost forgot. A glass globe like that didn't exist when Da Vinci was alive, so... Let me know in the comments below and don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. It's free. See ya.